masterclass. Without wasting any further time, I would like to invite a speaker for today's masterclass, Dr. Mayur Parihar, Senior Consultant, Lab Hematology and Molecular Pathology, Head, Department of Cytogenetics, TMC Kolkata, PI and Clinical Scientist at Tata Translational Cancer Research Center, Kolkata. Over to you, sir. Yeah, hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes is uh, you cannot, okay, let me share my screen. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, sir, it is visible. Just click on the slideshow so that it can be visible, yeah. So it has to ensure that so it has to ensure that such that that it's it is in the form of a thread within the nucleus and as the cell starts dividing it is not possible to actually you know divide this thread-like material into two equal halves in, uh, among the dividing cells. So what happens is the DNA starts condensing itself as the cell divides, and then it forms condensed bodies, what are called as chromosomes. Now these chromosomes are visible only during the detail i always love to touch upon this history of the discovery of dna structure it's a basic story of four people rosalind Fra franklin morris wilkins and of course Watson and Crick. so at that time everybody knew that whoever discovers the structure of dna is going to get the nobel prize and <clears throat> morris wilson wilkins and uh, rosalind franklin worked together in the same lab they hated each other right from the day they met right and so what they were actually doing was they were bombarding a DNA molecule with X-ray and this process is called X-ray diffraction photography or X-ray crystallography. So like how when you uh, put a light on an object, the object gives a shadow and you can analyze the shadow and know what the object is. So that is what they were doing. They were actually bombarding the DNA molecules with X-ray, then trying to analyze the images that, or the shadows that were created. Now this guy, Morris Wilkins, was very good with data analysis. And Rosalind Franklin was very good with getting the X-ray images. <coughs> Sorry. Because it was technically, uh, you know, quite challenging to actually get a DNA uh, image because, as I said, DNA has a very dynamic structure. So uh, on the other hand, Matson and Crick, uh, at that point of time, uh, they got along very well together. They thought that the DNA is a triple helical structure. So anyways, to cut the long story short, one day what happened was when Rosalind Franklin was away, Wilkins went to her office from the drawer, removed this picture of, which was called uh, uh, the picture 50 and showed it to Watson and Crick. And the moment they saw this, they realized that it's a double helical structure and they formed the DNA. So they went and said, 
that they have discovered the secret of life. They went to a pub where they used to visit frequently and made that announcement that we have discovered the secret of life. Three papers came later that year. But however, only uh, Watson and Crick and Morris Wilkins got the Nobel Prize for DNA structure. Rosalind Franklin died of cancer because of exposure to the X-ray and she never got the Nobel Prize. So later Watson uh, said in one of the meetings that he didn't steal the image, he was actually shown. But what this did was once the structure of DNA was identified, what you see here is an image from science where about 150 years of nature papers have been displayed. So each dot is a paper, uh, a published paper and how these papers connect with each other. Uh, if a paper has actually uh, referred to a work, it's connected to it. And, uh, it, and those papers which have been used as a reference lie below it. So you see before this point where Watson and Crick paper came about the structure of DNA, there were very few papers on genomics. So Watson and Crick, refer to a lot of papers in order to describe the structure of DNA. And once that was discovered, there was a huge change in understanding the DNA, understanding the biology and that in, in developing technologies. And then you can see there's a fountain of papers that came on genomics. So when you go practically to a lab, what are the genomic techniques that are available? Karyotyping is nothing but you look at all the chromosomes. It is a whole genome of a single cell. You can pick up ploides, that is gains or losses of chromosomes. You can pick up translocations. You can pick up structural abnormalities. Fish, you use a specific probe. So whatever question you are asking, it will answer only that. You can do single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is like a digital karyotype. It helps you to under identify copy number changes, structural abnormalities. And of course, we have high throughput sequencing and focused or targeted sequencing. So <clears throat> when I look at it as a pathologist. I would like to divide these techniques into those that are microscopic based and those which cannot be identified by human eyes. So karyotyping and fish, which is usually the routine bread and butter of a cytogenetic lab, are a microscopic based technique wherein you use microscope to look at the chromosomes and you use fish and you know you can actually look at the genes which are, are using fluorescent probes and the submicroscopic abnormalities you have the copy number alterations, which means gains or loss of genomic material. You could do SNP arrays or a targeted screening in the form of MLPA, or you could look at mutations that could be targeted or a whole genome level. Now, you must understand the one basic concept, which lab does what. So a cytogenetic lab studies structural chromosomal abnormalities. It does gene subbinding, fish arrays, etc. And a molecular lab actually goes deeper and looks at the nucleotides, so it does PCRs and sequencing and so on. Molecular cytogenetics is a marriage between conventional cytogenetic and molecular techniques, wherein you use you, you can use probes or sequences of nucleotides to do your cytogenetic study. And the molecular cytogenetic techniques are fish. I will talk about this in detail as we go ahead. Multicolor fish spectral karyotyping, comparative genomic hybridization, and SNP arrays. Now, usually karyotyping in fish are the routine uh, techniques that are used in a diagnostic laboratory. What is the difference between the two? Karyotype is, as I said, the whole genome of a single cell. You can actually look at all the chromosomes. You can look at the whole genome. You can identify for if there is a clonal evolution, if there are multiple abnormalities. Whereas fish will only answer the question you are asking. So you use specific probes and you ask a question, is BCR able present or absent? Fish will just give you that information that it is present or absent. It will not say, it will just say positive or negative. It will not give you information as to what is happening at the other part of the genome. So conventional cytogenetics is karyotyping. Usually, uh, you know, for hematological malignancies, we use bone marrow. As I said, chromosomes are visible only during metaphase. And that is why for conventional karyotyping, you need live cells. And hence the samples have to be transported immediately or as soon as possible. They shouldn't be frozen. You need fresh samples here. And what we do is we culture the cells to get the metaphases. You need to understand that in a bone marrow, the cells are spontaneously proliferating. So you do not add a stimulant. You do a spontaneous culture. You just put the bone marrow in a culture media and let it grow, let the cells divide. 
right? So lymph nodes are solid tumors, and in constitutional abnormalities, coronary equilibrium, they have spontaneous lymph proliferation. Well, however, if you need to know a constitutional uh, karyotype, uh, you need to stimulate cells. So you take a peripheral blood, you stimulate the peripheral blood lymphocytes by using PHA, which usually stimulates the T lymphocytes, and you get better phases. If you want to carry type plasma of CLL, you will have to use interleukins and interferons to stimulate the B cells to push them into division to look at their chromosomes or their carrier. Not send a sample in EDTA for karyotyping because EDTA actuates calcium. And then uh, because I said you need cells to be dividing, you need live cells, uh, EDTA will not work. So peripheral blood uh, should come into, as I said, uh, uh, preservative free sodium heparin. You could also send uh, lymph node biopsies in hematological malignancies. You can do FNACs and you can send the aspirate. You can send the pleural fluid. We have also fished CSF. And many a times when there is no sample available, you can actually take a stained bone marrow, destain it, and then fish it. So this is what happens in a conventional karyotyping. The marrow is taken. It's put in a RPMI cell culture, put it in an incubator with 5% carbon dioxide. And as the cells start dividing, the metaphase is arrested using colcimic. If we add some hypertonic solution, we make slides. Those slides are stained or banded. And then we have a microscope with a camera attached. We capture all the metaphases and then analyze them. Right. So this is how it goes. Uh, I'll just uh, go quickly here. So. For peripheral blood, it's a 16 hour culture. Bone marrow, we do 16 to 18 hours culture. Why 16 to 18 hour culture? Because it's based on the cell cycle. If you look at the timing of the cell cycle, it's about 17 hours. So whenever we do bone marrow cultures for hematological malignancies, we culture them for about 17 to 18 hours so that every, and we add colcimate there. So every time, we always you're supposed to do two cultures and every time a cell divides, the, meta, the metaphase will be arrested and you will be able to get metaphases. So we, as I said, uh, we do two cultures. One, we add colcimate and put it for culture. The other, we add the colcimate the other day. Now we culture overnight for 16 to 17 hours and then we harvest them. Chromosomes are best studied at metaphase and the protocols have to be followed. Well, uh, because this is what you want to look at. You want to look at the uh, chromosomes that are easily visible, they are well separated, the banding pattern is good, but a small error in following the protocol can result in a clumped metaphase like that. And in these cases, you just cannot analyze the chromosomes. Next question is, what do you mean by bands? So what we do is we stain the chromosomes, right, with the gene sustain, and it gives light and dark bands. So a chromosomal band is a part of a chromosome that can be distinguished from adjacent segments by appearing darker or lighter. It's just like the barcode you see in supermarkets. You scan the barcode and you will get your product. Similarly, a chromosome has light and dark bands. Now, you must remember that the light bands have active transcription sites. So the light bands are the ones which will produce your RNA and protein and the dark bands will not. So the more number of light bands a chromosome has means there are more number of genes that are present on them. So you can see here, we have a microscope, we have made a slide, there's a camera attached to be captured the metaphases and then this is how the metaphases look. These are the interface cells. And then we use a software to analyze and each chromosome has its own pattern of light and dark bands. And these chromosomes are based on their banding patterns are arranged. Once they are arranged, so it's, it's like morphology, then you look for changes. You look for structural abnormalities, translocations, deletions, and so on. This is what you see a metaphase from a patient of acute leukemia showing 77 chromosomes, right? Uh, so the first part is to actually arrange the chromosomes. And then you start looking for the banding pattern and just see for any subtle change in banding pattern. The moment there is a change in the banding pattern, you know there is an abnormality. And then you try to find out whether it it's a translocation, whether it's a structural abnormality, whether it's a duplication, whether it is inversion, and so on. So, for example, this was a patient of AML showing a translocation in 816. Uh, there can be very subtle abnormalities. These are patients of acute myeloid leukemia showing a 3-3 translocation. 
This is an MLL gene rearrangement showing 11, 19. So you see it's a very subtle arrangement. You look at this 19, it shows a dark band here. This is the only clue you will get. So it's a lot of morphology. It's a very laborious process. You need to go by band by band. You need to identify the abnormalities and you need to pick them up. What is FISH? Uh, as I said, FISH here is a, a procedure wherein is a technique wherein you ask specific questions. So you just apply the specific probe. So the first part, what you do is we denature the DNA and then we add the probe. And the probe, what it will do is it will find its place to the complementary sequences of the genes we are interested to study and we'll go and hybridize and then we will read the fish signal patterns under the microscope. For example, 922 or BCR ABL, the ABL1 gene, you have a red fluorochrome and for 22, you have a probe which has a green. So normally uh, in normal cells, you'll have two copies of every gene. So you'll see two reds and two greens. The moment there is a translocation, the 9 will give to 22, the 22 will give to 9, you will see yellow signals. So that is how we look at, uh, you know, dual color, dual fusion signal patterns. There are uh, different designs of probes that can be used. There are genes like MLL, which are very promiscuous gene. They have at least 100 different partners in 110 different translocations. So how do you design probes for them? So what we do is we use break apart probe wherein uh, the green and the red are together in a normal gene. And the moment there is a translocation, they get separated. For example, this is a normal cell. You can see the red and green are together here. This is an interface cell. What you see here is a metaphase. Here you see the red and green have separated. So these are called the break apart probes. This is for MLL or KMT2A gene. And you can see that this is rearranged. This is a metaphase. You can see this is a normal chromosome 11. This is a 10 11 translocation and the two, three prime and prime prime and have separated. Now what do you do when you have to fish on a solid tumor? You must understand that fish on solid tumor is technically much more demanding. You need to, um, there are a lot of processes that go into place. There are pre-analytical uh, uh, pre -analytical, uh, factors like the fixation, the kind of wax block that is made, the kind of xylene this is, have you used buffered formalin and so on. And it's much more technically demanding. Uh, we look for a lot of rearrangements on solid tumor. In hematological malignancies, we look for triple head lymphomas. We look for TB53 gene deletions in lymphomas. Uh, we do all kinds of translocations in lymphomas. So these are the pre-analytical recommendations for fish on solid tumors. Now coming to the basics of parts of a chromosome. So chromosome has a short arm called B arm, a long arm which is called U, Q arm and the centro and a centromere. Now you have metacentric chromosomes, submetacentric and acrocentric chromosomes. And we do follow an international system of cytogenetic nomenclature, which actually defines how a report has to be given. So whenever we talk about a band, we first write the chromosome number, then the arm symbol, the region number and the band within that number. So 1P31 indicates chromosome 1, short arm, which is P, region 3 and band 1. <laughs> we do have banding patterns, ideograms, which we follow. When we are doing our reporting, we look at the ideograms and see which bands are involved. And whenever we report in the square brackets, the number of cells that are showing a specific karyotype are mentioned. A lot of short forms have been defined by the ISCN where DL is deletion, dicentric translocations, isochromosomes, inversions, T's for translocations. So uh, you don't have to go remember all of this, but I'm just saying we do have certain uh, guidelines. So whenever a report is given, we write it in the ISCN format, but we also write the interpretation. Now, what are the types of chromosomal abnormalities? You could have numerical or structural. Numerical are aneuploidies, wherein you can have a loss of a chromosome or a gain of a chromosome. And polyploidy, wherein it's basically just a duplication. So 23 chromosomes becomes uh, 46, 46 chromosomes becomes 69. So multiples of 23 are called polyploidy. And the structural abnormalities include translocations, inversions, insertions, deletions, ring chromosomes, isochromosome, and extrastructural abnormal chromosome. So the examples for aneuploidy are uh, so 45 chromosomes or 47 chromosomes, and polyploidy, as I said, are 69 and 92. Now, 
let me just go to uh, just skip the slides now what about the genetic profiling in oncology practice when do we do genetic profiling in oncology practice you must understand that some of these tumors both in hematology and of course in solid tumors are characterized by their genomic signature so you can actually identify the abnormality and use that in diagnosis or these cytogenetic abnormalities are also used in risk stratification wherein low risk cytogenetic uh, abnormality patients get a low risk therapy and those with high risk cytogenetics get a higher therapy and then of course by identifying genomic abnormalities you have specific drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors in ph positive all and so on in oncology cytogenetics you need to understand the concept of clone so what is a clone a clone is defined as a cell population derived from a progenitor and the number of cells that constitute a clone is given in square brackets so for example this is 46 xx translocation a21 in 20 cells now in order to call something abnormal there should at least be two metaphases showing trisomy to call something monosomy you need three cells or three metaphases to call a structural abnormality you need two cells right so many a times i get reports for review across the country and you see reports like that now whenever you see a report like that you need to call that lab and ask them how many cells does the monosomy 7 is present because of a technical artifact if there is only it can be possible that the, there can be one cell where the chromosome 7 has got scratched off while cleaning the slide so you need to ask is it clonal or is it just a random abnormality how many metaphases have monosomy 7 so this is the kind of report you are looking for that seven metaphases have monosomy 7 and 13 metaphases are normal so whenever you have one metaphase only showing a monosomy the clonality is not established so there you have to ask for suggest to do a fish wherein you can do uh, specific probes for chromosome 7 and you can analyze a larger number of cells to prove clonality translocation as i said is exchange of material between two chromosomes a balanced translocation there is no gain or loss of material and unbalanced there is a loss or gain of genomic material so what is the effect of a translocation so a translocation can cause deregulation of genes by juxtaposition to strong enhancers for example in the 814 translocation wherein the igh enhancers lead to over expression of the mic gene in a translocation 814 the or you could have chimeric fusion transcripts now these chimeric fusion transcripts could affect the transcription factors for example in 821 the ranax1 which is a transcription factor can affect epigenetic modifiers like the KMT2A or the MLL gene. Translocations can affect cytokine receptors like the ALK gene in ALCL or can affect tyrosine kinases like BCR AP1. Let me show you an interesting case. Now, the question is do we need a blast to diagnose an AML? Yeah, I mean, we need this kind of a blast, of course. This is the kind of blast we don't need, but these are the blasts we see in our hematology labs on a day to day basis. So this was a girl, you know, the history was that uh, the whole family had viral fever and everybody had recovered. But her platelets continued to be low even after the, uh, for at least two to three weeks after the fever episode. So a marrow was done. And what marrow showed was a lot of hemophagocytosis, as you can see. This is the macrophage, it has eaten a neutrophil here. Now, in a viral, uh, uh, post-viral, you could see these kind of hemophagocytosis, which is reactive. And we looked that there was some amount of dysplasia present, blasts were less than 5%. A flow cytometry was done and flow cytometry showed some dysplasia, but there was no increase in blast. When we did the karyotyping, we got a translocation 821 with a deletion line. Now, as all of you know, the WHO's right from 2002 has said that if you have an 821 translocation, it is diagnostic of acute myeloid leukemia, even if blasts are less than 20%. Well, our patient had zero blasts, but we still had to call it an acute myeloid leukemia because the translocation 821 was present. The other abnormalities wherein you can call something an AML is inversion 16 and 1517, irrespective of the blast count. And in the new WHO, uh, a whole lot of genetic abnormalities, recurrent genetic abnormalities, you can call the patient of AML even if the blast is less than 20%. Now, what about, I'll just show you an example of a balanced translocation. This is a translocation 119 seen in patients 
of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and what you see here is an isochromosome 9. Right? Now this was a patient of a CML and a blast crisis. You can see the patient has a 119 and a 922. So the cytogenetic abnormalities can occur before the blast crisis can present. Right? You can have an unbalanced translocation like in this patient you have a derivative 17 which is a loss of 7q and a partial trisomy of 1q and these abnormalities are associated with higher high risk in myeloid neoplasm. Now this was a patient of chronic myeloid leukemia who was not responding to treatment. A karyotype was sent to us and we found 922 an extra Philadelphia chromosome and trisomy 19 clearly showing that there is clonal evolution and the patient is progressing towards a blast crisis. Yeah. Now you can get three-way translocations. The three-way translocations are similar to the normal translocation. And even by a fish pattern, you can identify a three-way translocation. What do you mean by inversion? Now, inversion is when a part of a chromosome cuts and then completely turns upon itself. It's called as an inversion. Now, inversions can be difficult to detect on karyotype morphologically. Inversion can be either a paracentric, where inversion happens on only one side of the centromere, or pericentric, where they happen on both sides of a uh, centromere. So one such example is inversion 16. You can see it's a very subtle abnormality. The co-binding factor uh, beta, which is on the Q arm, MYH11 on the P arm, and whenever the inversion happens, the MYH and CBFB fuse to form what is called a, to result in a inversion 16 or form a CBFB MYH11 fusion. And this can be easily detected by a break apart fish probe. Similarly, in inversion 3, you can have the EVI1 and the GATA2 come together, resulting in overexpression, and that is associated with high risk. Insertion a small part of one chromosome can be inserted to other. Deletion is nothing but a loss of a part of a chromosome. So Deletion 5Q in myelodysplastic syndromes. An isochromosome is when one arm is lost and the other arm duplicates. So as I said, ISO 9Q. So what happens is the 9P is lost and the Q arm has duplicated. So it's a mirror image of one arm of the chromosome. Patient of CML not responding to therapy showing 922 and isochromosome 17P. So because of the isochromosome 17Q, what has happened is the p arm has got lost. The p arm houses the TP53 gene, resulting in deletion of the TP53 gene. Duplications are when a part of a genome duplicates itself. So duplication 1 is seen in, and there's a derivative 19 translocation 119 here. So duplication actually uh, uh, results in uh, additional copies of those specific genes. Now, when you look at karyotyping, you also look at clones and subclones. So, if you look at this patient, there are six metaphases showing 922, and there are 14 metaphases showing 922 plus trisomy 8. So, this clone is now evolving, has acquired trisomy 8, and this patient is moving towards blast crisis. Sometimes, what may happen is this was again a patient of CMN who con continued to have dysplasia and some amount of uh, pancytopenias. Uh, he was on imatinib and uh, when we did karyotyping, we just found the tri uh, uh, trisomy 8. We did not find the 922. And uh, so you can have a pH negative clone also come up in patients who are getting imatinib. Complex karyotype is defined as that which has three or more abnormalities. The MRC calls it pi. A monosomal karyotype is defined by presence of two autosomal monosomy or one single uh, autosome monosomy with a structural abnormality. So, this was a patient of MDS with deletion 5Q1 fish was on treatment. Uh, but when we did a karyotype, it showed a complex karyotype, and this patient soon evolved into an acute leukemia. Now, here there's an abnormality of a 3Q with monosomy 7. This is again a monosomal karyotype. Let me show you another interesting case the role of cytogenetics in transplant patients. So, this was a patient. Uh, of CML diagnosed in uh, CMC underwent a transplant and he underwent a haploidentical transplant wherein uh, the XY, so when you do a haploidentical transplant within the hematopoietic cells, the XY, which a male patient, become XX and that is when we use fish. So this is how it would look, XX and uh, XY and XS. So when we did uh, fish on this patient, 
what we found was he, he came back with a headache and there was suspicion of a viral fever and on follow up when we did fish because he had undergone transplant we thought we were expecting that all cells should be xx or if he has relapsed then the cells should be xy but what we found was we found about 30 percent cells showing a single copy of x and then we asked for a bcr abl fusion which showed additional copies and the karyotyping showed a deletion of chromosome y and that is why we were only seeing a single x chromosome in the uh, fish for xy for transplant and this is how the probe and i'm showing you this case so that you should realize that it is very essential to understand your probe designs before you interpret your fish there was another patient 32 year old um, and doing phd in us came to our hospital got his transplant done again he had a sex mismatch transplant uh, was okay for two years comes back after two years with headache the molecular chimerism is fine the bone marrow is he came with fever and headache the bone marrow was fine immunophenotyping was fine now we were expecting that all his metaphases should have shown an xx but what happened was that this patient actually was relapsing and we found six metaphases showing xy along with 1122 so even before the disease had come back even before the myeloid leukemia had come back we were able to genomically uh, you know preemptively identify that the disease is going to come back so he was then, uh, uh, treated actively and aggressively underwent a second transplant and is doing fine now array cgh is uh, and snp arrays are used used more and more nowadays wherein on an snp array you have a lawn of nucleotides on a chip what you do is you put the patient dna on it and you will get signals now let me show you one of our patients now this was a patient of uh, all 51 chromosome uh, actually relapsed and uh, we did an array on this and what we found on our array was that this patient had a deletion 70p which was not visible on karyotype so the tp53 gene was lost and he also had a necros deletion which both of these are high risk markers and that is the patient that is why the patient relapsed now, before I move ahead, I uh, just want to show you another case where how cytogenetics can help you to even <clears throat> identify floaters. So this was an 11-year-old boy. Clinically, they thought uh, he is having a testicular case of ALL. And what you see here is you see seminiferous tubule and uh, you see the relapse. And so this was a case uh, 46. This was the case number 47 which again should relapse. Now here the doubt whether this is a floater coming from this patient. Now this is how it looked. It was Pax by TDT positive. It was a you know, testicular relapse in that case. Now in this patient, we were not sure whether this, because the rest of the test is completely looks normal, whether this piece was coming from the previously biopsy uh, case. So what we did was uh, the one uh, which was clinically testicular had a 1221. The one where we suspected a floater was a high hyperdiploidy. We fished using uh, uh, the etv 6 x one probe and we showed that uh, both of these cases were actually relapses. Uh, there was no floater problem and we were able to sort this out. So with this, I have completed my talk for today. Uh, I am open for any questions. Uh, Dr. Suman, you need to unmute yourself. You can ask a question to Dr. Mayur. Uh, Dr. Gopinathan, please go ahead. Dr. Gopinathan. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Thanks for the very uh, nice and elegant lecture. Uh, can you just elaborate us on uh, plasma cell enrichment in myeloma? How do we go about okay. it? Yeah, so you see, I haven't completed, uh, I haven't covered individual diseases because the talk was basic of cytogenetics. In fact, um, you know, genomics of ALL, genomics of AML, genomics of myeloma are individual talks in themselves. So this was a talk only meant for just dealing with basics to show you what is done. So plasma cell enrichment is very essential. Uh, you should not be do performing fish 
in myelomas without doing plasma cell enrichment. So we do plasma cell enrichment uh, using uh, what are called as a CD138 antibodies, and then you have magnetic suppression kits available. So you add uh, CD138 antibodies, which have uh, tagged with iron particles. You put them in the marrow, the, they will attach to the CD138 positive plasma cells. You put them in the magnet, then you wash. And then on these enriched plasma cells, you put your myeloma fish panels. And then said, so you should not be doing myeloma fish on a marrow straight away. You have to enrich the plasma cells in, uh, for fishing in myeloma patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Suman, you can ask a question. Dr. Zubair, you can ask your question. Well, uh, good evening. Um, thanks for the excellent presentation, Dr. Mayur. Thank you. Uh, um, I just wanted to know about the additional chromosomal abnormalities which occur during the course of CML. <clears throat> Once okay. a patient is diagnosed newly, it doesn't okay. happen. But uh, when uh, months and years pass by, it develops additional chromosomal abnormalities. So mm -hmm. how are these detected by cytogenetics or by fish? So you see, uh, you know, in order to uh, look at additional cytogenetic abnormalities, you have to do karyotyping. And on karyotyping, you can check. So what we do is, uh, in our hospital, you know, generally the practice is we do not do karyotyping on every CML patient at diagnosis. We just fish them from peripheral blood because karyotyping requires a marrow. And the diagnosis is given. Now, suppose the patient is not responding to treatment or comes with low platelet counts or the response to imatinib has been suboptimal. That is when a marrow is done. And then we do karyotyping. And uh, by karyotyping, in most of these patients where they have suspected that something is amiss, we have identified additional abnormalities. Now, these additional abnormalities, as I said, could either be subclonal and they could be present along with 922 or you could sometimes get clones because imatinib would have killed the cells with 922. And then you can get clones which are pH negative, you know, Philadelphia negative, and you identify them. And this kind of then gives you an idea about uh, that uh, the cytogenetic abnormalities actually occur much before the uh, over to blast crisis happens. Yeah. Is it different from the <clears throat> mutational analysis which is done after starting the TKI treatment. Yes, yes, that is completely different because the mutation analysis you are just doing on the tyrosine kinase domain and the mutation analysis is uh, done from the RNA out there and you're just looking whether there are mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain which has resulted in a suboptimal response to treatment. It doesn't talk about clonal evolution there. But on cytogenetics, you pick up evolution, you pick up new clonal new clones that are evolving from an existing CML patient. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions, delegates? Delegates, you can ask your question to Dr. Mayur. Yeah, Dr. Trivni, you can uh, you can take your question. Dr. Trivni, please unmute yourself. Sir, very good evening, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, that was a fantastic information, sir, uh, for this particular evening. Thank uh, you. Uh, sir, uh, can you please elaborate on the application part of it, uh, sir, so that what is the scope area for the current research? Uh, definitely, yes, uh, in oncology studies and leukemia, yes, sir. But apart from that, is there any other focus area so that we can work on this particular? No, so, see, it is... It is very simple. Uh, now, a lot of molecular cytogenetic techniques are available, right? So, uh, the cytogenetics, you know, karyotyping is usually done only for hematological malignancies. Solid tumors, we do fish. We fish for a whole lot of 
solid tumors, if you look at cytogenetics in general, if, I mean, even beyond hematology, there are a lot of lung tumors, breast tumors, brain tumors, soft tissue sarcomas. There's a whole range where you can fish. Now, if you ask me what is the role of karyotyping in, uh, uh, say, in research, it depends on the research question you are asking. You know, it all depends on what question are you asking. Based on that, you may use any of the techniques that are available, right? So it's very difficult to say what is the role in research. It depends on the question you're asking. So uh, you want to look at, uh, say, you want to alter certain proteins and you play with certain genes and see whether chromosome morphology is changing, then you would require them. You want to study ploides and see whether any of uh, these are uh, changing the karyotype features, then you, you need to do karyotyping. So it all depends on the research question you're asking, the role of cytogenetics. Sir, is there any role with respect to AMR, sir? Antimicrobial resistance? No, 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 no role. It has no role with antimicrobial resistance. Only with respect to plasma. Okay. Yeah, it has no, no role. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Dr. Priyanka, please go ahead with your question. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very informative talk, sir. Thank you. Uh, I just had one question that if we are checking for Philadelphia, so uh -huh. does the fish proof covers the entire uh, 922, like the entire chromosomal no, part? No, So the fish, the, see the fish probe will cover the BCR and the ABL genes. Yes, the entire right. genes. And okay. irrespective of your breakpoints in the BCR or ABL, uh, right. you will be able to pick it up on the fish, right? Whereas PCR is more specific. So... You can always have a fish positive and PCR negative, because, yes. uh, depending on the breakpoints that are there. But fish will pick up any any breakpoint. Just any breakpoint. So there is no difference between uh, like cytogenetics is less sensitive, but yeah. in case the patient is negative by molecular and is negative by fish, is there a is there a chance that he could no. be positive by cytogenetics? So uh, generally, uh, if he is positive by karyotyping, you will always see it on fish. We'll always pick it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Madhura, you need to unmute yourself. Dr. Madhura, please ask your question. So I think there are no more questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just a moment, sir. Just a moment, Doctor S P Verma. Yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead. Uh, sir, excuse me, sir. Yeah, tell me, Triveni. Hello. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah, can, yeah, Hello, sir. Me. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, sir, can you please explain the concept of loss of heterozygosity and its uh, implication for pathological disorders, sir, please? Okay. So, now what do you mean by lo loss of heterozygosity? What do you mean by heterozygosity? Okay. Now, you have two copies of a gene. Okay. Now, uh, suppose one copy of the gene is lost. Suppose there is a deletion. There's a lot loss of heterozygosity. One is mutation, still a loss of heterozygosity. Now, there is something called as a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, right? A CNLOH, a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity means that there is uniparental isodisomy for that gene. So, what has happened is that there are two copies of the gene. One gene has got deleted and the other gene has duplicated itself, you know. And that is why you are having both the genes coming from same parent. So usually you have one gene coming from your mother, paternal origin, one coming from the uh, maternal origin. So in copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, what happens is both genes are coming from the same origin. Now what happens in uh, tumors is that uniparental isodisomy or copy neutral loss of heterozygosity is one mechanism wherein a heterozygous mutation can become homozygous. For example, and this is usually seen in myeloproliferative neoplasms, you know, in terms of your JAK2 mutations on short term of chromosome 9. 
So you have two two Jack two genes. One has got mutated. One is normal. Now the normal one has got deleted, and the mutated gene can then duplicate itself. And so what will happen is you will have a homozygous mutation. So that is called as copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. Is seen in various tumors as a mechanism uh, to uh, give selective advantage to tumor cells and promote growth. Yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, thank you, sir. But uh, but uh, does it carry any significance in catching up uh, some rare cases of aplastic anemia? I have read one article where the loss of heterozygosity of 60 was found yeah. to be associated with aplastic anemia. Of which course, was... see, it is used in various tumors. Now, sometimes what may happen is uh, uh, because of uh, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, uh, even in Franconies, it may so happen in a plastic anemia that uh, uh, you can have a, a phenotypic uh, a nature's gene therapy where it can result in the reversal of the disease. Okay, so that is also possible. So your abnormal okay. gene is got deleted and the normal is duplicated and replaced it. So that also happens. Okay, so it has a role in malaria. Oh, okay. Yeah, can be seen in a plastic anemia, is seen in malloproliferative neoplasm, seen in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So the mechanism based on the gene it involves and based on the, whether the copy neutral loss of heterozygosity has resulted in loss of the gene which is mutated or duplication of the gene that has mutation, the, the phenotypic effect may vary. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, excuse me, sir. One last question, sir. Yeah, tell me, to tell me. Uh, sir, uh, in your lecture, uh, so it is very much clear that we could able to predict in few of the cases, if at all, any particular cancer is going to reoccur. Yeah. Sir, uh, will it uh, answer in any case with respect to autoimmune diseases, sir? No, no, no. No. Karyotyping will not, cytogenetics will not help in predicting your autoimmune diseases, no. You okay. can do sequencing and look at certain polymorphisms that may be associated with certain autoimmune diseases, but not in cytogenetics. Uh, Dr. Okay, Mayur. Sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mayur, it was an amazing lecture. You started from the history, then the basics, and then you went to the complexities. Probably you covered the cytogenetics and the fish part, and the remaining molecular and uh, next generation sequencing. Uh, would you can we request you in your next sessions if you could um, cover oh, these topics? Yeah, of course. See, because uh, today's topic was just basic of cytogenetics, I could also take basics of molecular genetics in terms of technique, how to apply, which technique, where, where do you apply? So there are see there are different aspects of it. Uh, one aspect is to understand the basics. The, then there are aspects of uh, applying these in various hematological malignancies. So say no. AML, role of genomics, myelodysplastic, role of genomics, myeloma, role of genomics, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So each of them is one-hour yeah. talk, yeah? yeah. And um, in future, uh, when we have more such talks, I can, of course, talk on each of these topics later. Yeah, sure. And one session on flow cytometry, elaborating all the... Yeah, yeah I'm sure. I think I'm sure the... Organizers, ISHBT are listening to this and they will organize more lectures on flow and these. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, I think if there are no more yeah, questions. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah? Dr. Mayur, thank you very much for thank a wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. And thank you all the delegates for coming. Thank you everybody. For... Thank you, sir.